Thank you all for joining us once again for our uh, Wednesday Bi uh, midweek Bible study. And um, uh, without wasting time, let's uh, uh, start this with a word of prayer as, a, as we always do. Uh, we have 30 minutes of uh, teaching session and then uh, uh, the forum will be open for discussion. Feel free to ask questions, comment, uh, comment or if you want to add anything, please feel free to do so. Uh, we'll start our Bible study with a word of prayer. Let's all, uh, shall I ask you to look unto the Lord in prayer? Father, we are so grateful to you for this time, Lord. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity that we could come here and to learn uh, from your word, O oh Lord, especially. Uh, we consider this is a special moment where we can hear your voice, O oh Lord. We ask you to open our hearts and minds so that we may be able to receive and perceive what you wanted to communicate with us. Uh, communicate to us through your servant, O oh Lord. And uh, help us, Lord, by the uh, by Holy Spirit, grant us your illumination. Throughout the meeting, Lord, your name be exalted. Everything that we study, we discuss, uh, may bring glory unto your name, and it may help us to experience you more closer as never before, O oh Lord. Leaders and guiders, your name be exalted, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And uh, I'll ask Pastor to take it over. Yes, thank you, Praveen, for the prayer. And uh, good evening to all of my church family uh, joining us today. Uh, once again, uh, just to remind you that we are studying the seventh section in our book, which is titled, We Believe. The section we are studying is the Holy Scripture. Uh, what do we need to understand about the scriptures that we have? And I was uh, just interested to read that, you know, we have, uh, we are living in a time today where lots of people are Christians, but they don't fully understand what the scriptures are all about. Some of them are biblical illiterates, <laughs> like they say. Uh, there is uh, so much of illiteracy in terms of uh, Bible knowledge. And I was just uh, looking through some of the answers to questions that were given. Uh, and, uh, you know, people being asked about what they know about the Bible. And some of them are quite hilarious. For example, some people believe that the story of Superman and Harry Potter are biblical. Uh, they believe it is in the Bible. Uh, many apparently cannot name the four gospels, the four gospels, the four first books in the New Testament. Some believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Joan of Arc was a historical figure, uh, but you know, that's the kind of uh, mismatch that they do. How about this? Some people believe that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. Okay. And uh, one more, and that is uh, uh, some have believed that the one who preached the Sermon on the Mount was Billy Graham. Okay. Okay. Uh, this with this kind of misinformation, let's do a recap on uh, what we have studied so far, and we'll pick up from where we left off uh, last time. Uh, just to bring up, just to bring you up to speed as to what we have studied so far, we first need to recognize and understand that the Holy Scriptures, the Bible as we under, as we know it today, is not just an instruction manual. Lots of people like to believe that it's an instruction manual, right? Or uh, it is a prophetic book. And because it contains prophecy, they tend to believe that the Bible is only a prophecy book. Some would like to equate the Bible to a health and wealth book of secrets. You know, in other words, how to become healthy and wealthy. And uh, you can read the Bible for that. And that's how some people believe that. Uh, some tend to think that the Bible is just 
uh, a book of various laws and especially laws of success and and uh, the laws of science so uh, you know these are uh, the, the the bible may contain elements of all of these but fundamentally as i would like to say and i hope you are not offended by my saying this i'd like to say that the bible is a love story it is a story but it's a love story it's the story of a loving god whom we know as father son holy spirit and how this god of love is a god who shares that love with humanity and so uh, that is how i'd like to you know put across uh, this uh, this book that we call the bible now of course uh, it is a faithful witness to jesus christ and the gospel uh, the good news that god includes humanity in the circle of love so that's the lens from which we want to read the scriptures uh, fundamentally it's a wonderful story like i was saying earlier and it's a story where god includes our story into his story uh, you may have heard about how we refer to that uh, through the messages we have preached in the past but i think if you look at it from that perspective uh, i think you know we can uh, we can really begin to enjoy reading the scriptures from that perspective now we also discussed how the bible is the old testament and the new testament the two major sections in the scriptures that were put together uh, and we believe that what is contained in the old and in the new are the canonical scriptures in other words they are the one that has been uh, authorized to be uh, scripture now do we need we uh, we need both we need the old testament and the new testament because uh, without the old you don't complete you or rather you don't get the complete story the old testament reveals how god's purpose begins to take shape through adam and eve and of course the patriarchs and then ancient israel as a nation and the prophetic messiah the old testament is a constant reference to all of these to and to the prophetic messiah but when you come to the new testament the new testament begins to reveal uh, the fulfillment of that purpose that god began uh, in the old testament with regards to god's purpose for human beings so the new testament is a fulfillment of all that was written in the past in the incarnation of jesus christ our lord in other words the old testament is uh, points to jesus more than anything else and anybody else it points to jesus uh, the prophecies that we read in the old testament cannot be understood uh, without that final reference to jesus in the new you see um, the prophecies basically are referring to the fact that we need a savior right uh, it is referring to the fact that righteousness cannot be fulfilled through human effort that we need a savior and so the old testament with all its commandments and all its laws and regulations is a pointer towards the fact that human beings need a savior and that savior is jesus christ our lord so you begin to see how the old and the new fit together they both complete the story all right so uh, another section we already dealt with is the inspiration of scripture now this is a very important belief for us as uh, christians we believe in the inspiration of scripture or the fact that uh, uh, the scriptures are inspired of god of the holy spirit what does it mean when we say inspiration of the scriptures or uh, the the bible is inspired it means that it is not just a collection of human opinions it is not something that human beings decided to record a story and they put some stories together 
and we have the scriptures. No, uh, it, it, it's, it's neither a dictation. Uh, the Bible is not a dictation, but the Bible is uh, 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 God breathed as we can read in the book of Timothy as Paul writes. Uh, it is God breathed, in other words, inspired of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so when we understand the scriptures that is inspired of God, God breathed, we begin to realize it's both divine and human. It's divine in the sense that it has the inspiration of God, it is human because it is written by human beings. Uh, uh, written by people within their culture, within their context, within their language, right? So that is where the human element comes. But the divine element is the inspiration that the Holy Spirit provides. I'd like to read one scripture in Second Peter chapter, uh, chapter 1. I think uh, this is a scripture that sort of tends to make it a little bit more clear with regards to the uh, inspiration. Let's just uh, let me just read to you 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21. Uh, notice it says, uh, above all, I'm reading 2 Peter chapter 1 verses 20 and 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. In other words, it is not just human opinions or uh, just completely done by human beings. But now verse 4, 3, 21 is important. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. There comes the inspiration. There comes the divine element. It was something that God ordained for it to be recorded. Human, I mean to say, uh, his words were recorded by human beings. So we have both the uh, human element and the uh, divine element. So the scriptures as we have it today needs interpretation. Okay. It needs interpretation. Uh, and last time we ended by uh, reading the scripture which said that the Bible is the written word of God. That is 7.5, if you're referring to your uh, book, We Believe. Uh, we had uh, just finished off 7.5. Let's now go to uh, uh, the next section, the uh, next question, which is, why is Jesus Christ called the living word of God? I think we made reference to that last time. We said the Bible is the written word of God, but we know Jesus Christ to be the living word of God. Now let's read that and then I will make some comments. 7.6, the answer reads, the fullness of God's revelation is found in Jesus Christ, who not only fulfills the Holy Scriptures, the written word of God, but is himself the living word of God. Ignorance of the written word is thus ignorance of Jesus, the living word. We worship and pray to him, not to the Bible. For Jesus alone is the way, the truth, and the life. But he has given us his written word through his appointed apostles, and so we cannot truly know him apart from holy scriptures. So, why does or why do we say that Jesus Christ is the living word of God? The very first sentence we read is why did the fullness of God's revelation is found in Jesus Christ. The, the written word of God reveals the purpose of God and how God unfolds that purpose as is recorded in the New Testament, I mean, the Old and the New Testament. But when Jesus came in the incarnation, he brought the full revelation of God in terms of who God is. All right. So the fullness of God's revelation is found in Jesus Christ. So it's a revelation. 
the written word of god reveals god the living word of god reveals god so that's why jesus christ becomes the living word of god okay now it also says ignorance of the written word is thus ignorance of jesus in other words uh, if we want to know who jesus is we have to go to the scriptures now jesus is the full revelation of god but how do we know that we know that because the old testament prophecies refer to jesus refer to the messiah who was to come and he then brings the complete revelation of God. All right. So once again, we are beginning to see how there is a need for us to study the scriptures. Uh, the, the, the written word of God is given to us so that we would spend time studying the scriptures because that reveals who Jesus is. And then when Jesus comes, we have the fullness of that revelation in him. Uh, so if we need the full revelation we need jesus but if we have to know who jesus is we need the bible so they go together right uh, they they cannot be uh, either or they are uh, inclusive they are both together uh, all right let me make one more comment here now there may be a question uh, when we have said uh what about i mean to say what about those who are illiterate and cannot read the bible or what about those who probably have no access to the bible to the written word of god uh how does uh, how will they know about jesus right uh now that's that's a fairly uh, you know i mean to say a difficult question but let me just answer it in this way we know that that God chose the Bible, the written word, to be a way of revealing himself. Okay? Now, we also have to understand that is that God is not just limited to the word of God. Right? Now, so if there are people who have no access to the word of God, the written word, or are illiterate and cannot read, God is not limited. He is able to reveal himself in ways that we might not be able to fully fathom or understand. Now, we know that the Old Testament helped people understand who Jesus was. Uh, we, we just uh, discussed that. So there is no excuse for us to say that, you know, we don't have to read the scriptures. I just need Jesus Christ and I can put the scriptures aside. So for us, who can read the scriptures, who have access to the scriptures, I think we have no excuse in not studying it and not reading it and understanding the fullness of the revelation. But I would only say that those who might be illiterate or no, have no access, God can reveal way in ways that uh, goes beyond it. Uh, for example, today we have preaching in the church. So there may be people in the church who might probably be illiterate, or might not be able to read uh, they have the preaching they are exposed to the preaching and faith comes by by the word of god or the, the preaching of the word of god and so there are ways where god is able to bring the knowledge of god you know to these people all right we will then move to the next question we will uh, look at hopefully three more questions and then we will open up for some discussion we're going to 7.7 .7 now. Uh, and the question reads, what is the relationship between the Holy Scriptures and the living word of God? So the Holy Scriptures are the written word of God and we have Jesus Christ as the living word of God. The answer to that question reads, by the Holy Spirit, the Holy Scriptures put us in touch with Jesus Christ, the living word of God. By the Spirit, the living Word of God can speak personally to His people in and through the Bible. Through the authoritative and infallible written Word of God, we come to know surely and definitely who Jesus Christ is in relationship to the Father, 
and the Holy Spirit. While the written word can be distinguished from the living word, they can never be separated. They must always be treated together for their ministries are inseparable in the Holy Spirit. All right. So what do we understand by that? Uh, remember, the Holy Scriptures puts us in touch with Jesus Christ. It reveals Jesus. The Holy Scriptures, especially the Old Testament, prophetically reveals who Jesus Christ is. So we need the Scripture. And in that respect, let me read you one scripture in the book of John chapter 5. It's very interesting what Jesus has to say about uh, the scriptures himself. Uh, in, in the gospel of John chapter 5, I will read to you verses uh, 39 and 40. Uh, notice what Jesus says about the scriptures. John chapter 5 verse 39. It says, you study the scriptures. Diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. And of course, he completes in verse 40 by saying, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So uh, I think uh, very interesting thoughts Jesus brings in. First and foremost, he validates scripture. He's saying that the scriptures refer to him. They testify about him. So it is through the scriptures we know who Jesus is, the prophesied Messiah, the one who is the incarnate son of God. All right. Now, now that Jesus has come, we come to him also because in him we have the fullness of life, the full revelation. And so in these scriptures, he is, of course, chiding the religious leaders by telling them that if you stick to the Old Testament, you are going to miss out because I am the living word of God. By not coming to me, you are going to be missing out. So uh, uh, very powerful words that Jesus brings out there. Uh, the answer here also talks about how the word of God can speak personally to his people. Right. Um, uh, by the spirit, in other words, the, the living word of God can speak personally to his people. In other words, uh, remember we said what about those who might not read be able to read or might not or might be maybe illiterate uh, might not have access to the bible here it says by the spirit the living word of god jesus christ can speak personally to his people how does he do that well uh, i've i'm amazed how some people are able to perceive and be convicted about jesus christ being the savior uh, maybe through dreams or maybe through certain thoughts that the Holy Spirit plants in uh, one's mind. Maybe through preachings of somebody who preached about Jesus. So, so once again, we are very clearly establishing that there is no limitation for God to reach people who might be illiterate or who might not have a Bible. And so we need both. I hope you recognize that. We need the written word of God and we need the living word of God. They go together. And here is one very important point we cannot afford to uh, we cannot afford to miss. I'll just read, let me read that. It says, while the written word can be distinguished from the living word, they can never be separated. Right? They must always be treated together. In other words, uh, the living word of God, Jesus Christ. And the written word of God, the Bible, are always consistent. They can never be contradictory. You can never see anything in Jesus that contradicts scripture. Uh, you can never see anything in the Bible that contradicts what Jesus, who Jesus is and what he does. All right. Uh, so this is where sometimes uh, we, we tend to, you know, get a little confused. I was, I was talking to someone uh some some time back and we were talking about the ten commandments and uh, he was saying that uh jesus came to not to remove or not to uh you know um, do away with the commandments and so he was basically trying to prove that you know the sabbath commandment had to be kept 
Now, remember, when Jesus said, I have come to fulfill, uh, he is not contradicting anything in the old. But what the problem is, what we don't understand what it means to fulfill. Now, that's, of course, a, a topic for another day. Uh, but I just want to reiterate the fact that Jesus Christ as the living word, the Bible as the written word are always consistent. There, there can never be a contradiction. And, and uh, the way we understand the revelation through the scriptures and the way we understand revelation through Jesus Christ must be consistent. Uh, you, we cannot uh, pit them against each other. All right. So that is something that we need to keep in mind. Okay. Let's move to 7.8 now. We will read uh, two more, hopefully, and we can uh, discuss. We're going to the question 7.8, which says, how should Christians interpret and teach the Holy Scriptures? The answer says, just as the Holy Scriptures were not originally given through private understanding of the things they address, so they must not be understood which means translated, read, interpreted, preached, taught, and obeyed privately. Okay, we will talk a little bit about that a little later. The answer continues. Instead, the Bible is to be understood, conveyed, and lived out in the community of the body of Christ, the church. It is to be interpreted in its plain and canonical sense, respectful of the church's historic and consensual reading of it. We do so taking seriously the providentially appointed form of human languages, times, and circumstances in which the Bible was written. The Holy Scriptures are to be interpreted with Jesus Christ as their center, for he alone is the living word of God, the Son of the Father. Okay, there are a few things there that may be just a little uh, confusing. But let's, uh, let's uh, just pick up a few thoughts there. Now, it says to us that when we read Holy Scripture, uh, we, we interpret it, we try to understand it. How do we do that? It says the Bible is to be understood, conveyed and lived out in the community of the body of Christ, the church. Right? Uh, you see, whenever we read Scripture, uh, whenever we read the, and study the word of God, it's always in a context, okay? Um, and here we are being told that it has to be done in the context of the church. We're introduced to the church, okay? In other words, whenever we read scripture, we must also include in our minds, how does the church understand it? What does the church has to say about it? So that is why it is saying it is not to be interpreted just privately. In other words, you just don't understand something from the scriptures and say, well, that is my interpretation. I don't care what the church thinks. That is not how we must read scripture. There must be a consistency between how the church is understanding it and how we should understand it. Now, that does not mean to say that scripture can inspire us personally. There are words in the scriptures, there are psalms, uh, which we are reading on a regular basis now, which has uh, some special, un, I'm going to say, meaning for us. But, but we must always recognize that our understanding of scripture cannot contradict of how the church understands it. Right? So that is where it says, um, that they must not be understood privately, right? So it has to be done in the context of the greater body of, uh, you know, uh, which is, the, of course, the church. Now, uh, here, once again, uh, if I can just bring this thought up, there is a relational component when we read the scriptures. Yes, we may be privately and personally inspired, but there has to be a connect with the larger body of Christ. There has to be a relational uh, reality that also has to be understood, right? Uh, 
if we don't do that if we think that you know i can understand scripture by my own interpretation and i believe what my interpretation is right you know that is what gives rise to cults people who then think that god has spoken to them and then they can move away from the church they can establish their own little group and have their own private understanding of what scripture says and that is how we have so many cults that have come up who do not have any responsibility to the larger community which is called the church and that is where it becomes dangerous so uh, i think this is a very important point for us to read and i think for us especially in our church coming from the wcg background we have to recognize that uh, our interpretation of scripture must also pull in the church's historic understanding of the scriptures and that is what and that's another very important thing we have to keep in mind notice it say, it says it is to be interpreted in its plain and canonical sense respectful of the church's historic and consensual reading of it what does that mean that's a lot of words there eh? but what it means is when it says it has to be interpreted in its in its canonical sense it means that our understanding of any portion of scripture should also give reference to the whole of scripture you cannot isolate one part of scripture and take an understanding or meaning out of it leaving out the rest of the scriptures leaving out the rest of the bible we cannot do that what we understand from one portion of scripture should be consistent with the entire bible because the entire bible is a story remember it's an it's a story that unfolds one part of the story cannot be cannot be uh, removed from the other part of the story they have to go together that's the canonical sense with which we read and it also says respectful of the church's historic and consensual reading of it in other words we have to look at the understanding of scripture from how the church fathers understood it how the early early church understood it how the leaders of the early church and the continuing leaders of the church as the development took place we must all bring pull 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 all of this together now there may could there could be some errors but over time god brings in corrections and the church is led to understand scripture in the correct sense now though it says uh, uh, church's historic and consensual reading of it in other words consensual means agreement agreement with the historical interpretation agreement with the interpretation given to us by the church fathers right as much as we can recognize it to be canonical in other words consistent with all of scripture okay one more point we will uh, bring i want to bring from this uh, particular section notice it says the holy scriptures are to be interpreted with jesus christ as their center in other words once again we go back to what we said earlier jesus christ is the focus that is what he said in john chapter 5 the scriptures testify about me the scriptures are a faithful witness to jesus christ our lord who comes to help us understand the fullness of the revelation that we need a savior that righteousness comes through you know christ our lord it is not through human effort uh, but christ has come to bring us uh, a full understanding of our relationship with god that it is out of grace and faith in jesus christ our lord so uh, remember every time you read scripture you must also ask the question how does that connect to jesus christ how does that reveal jesus christ right when you read the laws i mean particularly the laws how does that refer to jesus christ and that is where we will begin to understand that jesus christ didn't do away with the laws but he came to fulfill it and so when you read the laws from the perspective of how jesus christ is the focus of it then we will see the consistency then we will see how the story unfolds otherwise lot of confusion begins to prevail all right
So I think uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a fair bit uh, of uh, heavy theology that we have just gone through. Maybe I'll stop there. Uh, let me see. I think we have about 20 minutes left and we can spend some time in uh, discussion. All right. Let me go back to looking at all of you here. All right. Good. Uh, thank you all. Uh, when we started, we, have about, we had about eight. Now I notice there are 12 of you who have joined in. I hope I made sense as I read through because there was some pretty uh, heavy stuff that we had to deal with today. Okay, open up, open for questions and comments, any thoughts that you would like to share. I'm very interested in how you understand some of these things. You don't have to ask the question, but just let me know how you look at these. And, uh, you know, it's always, it, it gives me some, uh, what do you say, uh, some idea as to whether I am going on the right track. Okay. Who's brave enough to be the first? <laughs> Sikandar, uh, did you have a question or, or a comment? I thought you were asking a question. Vanessa, yes, go ahead, Vanessa. <laughs> Vanessa is always asking something, no? Well, we, uh, we're happy you're doing, doing that. <laughs> Uh, okay, I don't want to ask about the scriptures, but what about the covenant? In, in the Bible, it is written that they're uh, going to make a new covenant. After Jesus came, God said that uh, the covenant that was made, now a new covenant is going to be made. Yes. So that means laws and things can change? Okay. Uh uh, let, let me see if I understood your question. You are saying that because we are going to have a new covenant, uh, all the laws that are given in the Bible are going to change. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, if I understand, if I remember well, the new covenant uh, is made in such a way where, and I specifically it says that the laws will be written on our hearts. You remember that? I think it's in the book of Hebrews. Yes. Right? And also in the major prophets. Uh, the laws will be written on our hearts. So, the change here is not that uh, God gives a new set of laws, but the laws that derived out of the very nature of God which is love, is going to be reflected in our hearts, is going to be cemented in our hearts. In other words, uh, we don't have to go to, you know, an external reading of the laws. The laws will, be, will become part of us, part of our nature. You know, God will make it so in the new covenant, right? Of course, it is done in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, the ministry of Christ and the Holy Spirit. So, uh, uh, the law now remember the old covenant had many laws but Jesus Christ came in the New Testament and reduced it to well at one time reduced it to two and then he said that I'm going to give you a new commandment and reduced it to one all right now what I the way I understand it is these are nothing more but the very essence of the law the old covenant is just a, the way the laws are manifested in various cultures, in, that, in, in, in various contexts. But the law finally, you know, trickles down to one important concept, and that is love. That is what is going to be in our heart. Now, I'm not sure if I answered your question, but feel free to come back. And uh, any others who would like to contribute to that? Answer, please feel free to do so. Praveen, if you have any thoughts, go ahead. Uh, the Old Testament contains uh, so many laws. In other words, in, in simple words, if you say there are so many rules in the Old Testament, it says, don't do this, don't do that. As children, we always ask uh, a question to parents whenever they say, don't do this or don't do that. We ask the question, uh, you know the question? 
why why <laughs> why we shouldn't do that why we should do that so the old testament always tells don't do this or do this we have the question why now jesus came by then we are matured and he gave the answer why the answer why is god loves us and we love him that's why we don't do the first five uh, command we we do observe the first five commandments and we love our neighbors because love of god has poured into our our hearts that's why we don't do the second five of the commandments so we got the answer why because god loves us and if we are in relationship with him that's why we do the first five and we don't do the second five because his love has been poured in our hearts and we love our neighbors so jesus came he fulfilled so always the curious question we had why should we do or why shouldn't we do and he came and he revealed it to us and he fulfilled the entire commandments thing in simple words to take does it make any sense uh, i may want to i may just want to add that uh, you know when you talk about the covenants the old covenant the new covenant uh, you know i think we need to do a deeper study and then only then we'll be able to fully recognize and appreciate uh, what is the old what is the new a lot of confusion has existed and i still exist i would think in our own fellowship we had we had lots of confusion we believed that we were under the new covenant but we believed that we had to observe certain uh, laws that were particularly to the you know referred in the old for example the tithing system the food laws of course the 10 commandments the keeping of the festivals the keeping of the sabbath these were all references in the old uh, but we said we were under the new covenant and so there was a lot of confusion and uh, when we went through reformation we did a major study on all of these things and uh, uh, we we concluded on you know we came to a very clear understanding on on these so what we'll do is the study of the covenants is maybe part of our bible study so when we come to that we will probably go into it a little bit more deeper all right that is uh, that is true okay <laughs> yes sir yes vanessa go ahead okay so the sabbath what which day is actually the real sabbath day <laughs> okay And okay whether it is a saturday a sunday or a monday and and as god says that you are supposed to rest on the sabbath day not do anything but then if you say sabbath day is on a sunday then why do they have the church on sunday okay why people are still working on sundays people are still doing things he says not to do anything even any household work no nothing but then sunday is the day when you get off so sunday you have to do everything so uh, are we not disobeying that and doing things on sabbath okay this is where the classic confusion comes <laughs> this is the classic in fact what you what you hit you really hit the nail on the head when you said which is the which is the sabbath day now i'm i'm presuming you think that the saturday is a sabbath day or you might think sunday is a sabbath day right i'm not sure what you think <laughs> <laughs> i think sunday is a sabbath day <laughs> okay you think sunday is the sabbath day but of course the bible says seventh day of the week is the sabbath as is given in the uh the commandments right the seventh day now uh some people say sunday is the first day so you have changed the sabbath from the seventh to the first <laughs> now i i can ask you on what authority have you done that <laughs> okay but you see here is the confusion and i once again i don't have the time to go into a major study what i understand is this when you come to the new covenant the sabbath day has changed or has uh, uh, the word change may be confusing again the sabbath day has been fulfilled not in another day but in a person you see the sabbath day has been fulfilled in a person called jesus christ 
So for me, under the new covenant, the Sabbath is a person, not a day. You see, so when a Sabbath becomes a person, I have rest all seven days of the week. I don't have to look at one day for a rest. My rest is in Jesus. That is why Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. So what I believe is the Sabbath command has been completed or fulfilled in a person called Jesus. He has become my Sabbath. And hence, every single moment I'm at rest in him because of what he has accomplished for me on on the cross and in his incarnation. Let me leave it at that. <laughs> I hope I've not confused you entirely. No, this is, this is something this is something new I learned. So okay. this, this is a is a, a better way of thinking of the Sabbath day then. Uh, yes. This is what our the reformation in our church has done for us. We are now begin to see, remember Jesus said the scriptures are a test, is a testimony to himself, to him. So all of these, the feast days and the Sabbath days and all of those things have come now to be fulfilled in Jesus. And that is what is important for us to understand. So all of this culminates in, that's why Jesus said, I have not come to destroy the law. I have come to fulfill it. In other words, he's saying, I am the law now. <laughs> I am the law. Rest in me. You fulfill the law when you rest in Jesus. Because Jesus has fulfilled the law. Once again, I hope that does not open a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> and Sajira is looking at me. <laughs> we have had several discussions on this. <laughs> and I'm, and I'm not sure if we still understand, but I think uh, that's a very important question you've asked. Yes, David. Yeah, Borova, just to qualify on this point. Uh, <clears throat> Jesus himself is the Lord of Sabbath. I mean, this uh, Sabbath, so yeah. he's Lord over Sabbath. So that qualifies uh, just the point what he was saying. Yeah, that's a very powerful statement. Uh, you know, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I mean, uh, he is basically saying, you know, he supersedes the Sabbath. But then, you know, uh, we, when we get stuck with and we don't understand the covenants, we think that the Sabbath is, uh, is still a day where we have to not cook on it on that day not work on that day and, and and we missed the point completely yeah we had something to eat uh, theologically seeing uh, some beautiful thing we can see in book of genesis mm. genesis chapter 1 it explains about the creation and uh, as god created uh, each thing a day and uh, it, the that creation com the day completes like this Evening and morning, first day. Evening and morning, second day. Evening and morning, third day. Do you remember that? And yeah. so continuously it goes till uh, six days. And uh, regarding the seventh day, it says, uh, Oh, God rested on the seventh day. I, it's not like God got tired, so he needs, uh, he has backache, so he has to rest uh, with his, uh, you know, his, his, uh, like sitting at beach or something. <laughs> it's not like that. But God delighted in the seventh day, seeing all the work of the six days. It is good. He was delighted. He was happy in his heart. That is the seventh day. And, uh, you know, how does the seventh day end? Seventh day doesn't end. Evening and morning, it's the seventh day. It's not there in the scripture. Seventh day doesn't end. In other words, to say, God created everything. And he said, it is very good and he is delighted. Even, let me take it even personal. God created everything and he created you and me. And he is delighted. And said, it is very good. And that day did not end till now. Sabbath day started from the day that God rested. And it is continuing even till now and it will continue forever. Which tells us uh, God is delighted in you and me, number one. Okay. Uh, Number two thing, uh, God speaks about Sabbath. Sabbath day is, as I said, from the creation it is there. But we humans, we don't know about it. So he is delighted, he is happy about us. And he, uh, what, uh, what loved us, what really loved us. When we love somebody, we cannot keep it to ourselves. We need to go and tell them. 
we need to go and propose that right so god proposes that that i am delighted in you so you know at once to bring all the truth people are not able to understand because of the sin so he is introduced that through seventh day okay first what we'll do is one day a week we'll go for a date and he called the seventh day as sabbath and he is taking us on a date and when the fullness of time come when jesus came he revealed i'm totally delighted in you and uh, that's what jesus is called G uh, ad you know from jesus we call the day, the day of the lord ad the full form of ad is the day of the lord the day where god rests god delighted god reigns in other words that is a sabbath day jesus came and the, he introduced completely the sabbath day and he said we got married now you know every day is a new date now now onwards so that is the message which was on J in genesis chapter 1 the seventh day did not end god started teaching it slowly that is through moses in exodus said so let's go for date on every seventh day and completely he taught that he, that about our marriage jesus came and said from today onwards everything is new and i'm totally delighted in you today onwards it is the day of the lord when the day of the lord is going to end it will never end ad will never end it continues forever so that's a small thing we can see in this david you had a thought yeah actually uh, on the connection of the seventh day which uh, which is as praveen said rightly said uh, <clears throat> but i had a, a doubt here at one point where it um, uh, the second coming of christ would the seventh day and because after that is a judgment day uh, is it something to because i just had a thought on that so am i uh, can you just explain on this point please definitely david the judgment day is part of the day of the lord and okay. judgment should not be taken we christians we are believing in the lord jesus has taken our judgment okay. so we, that is the day where we are going to celebrate and all this old testament uh, saints and all celebrated the judgment of god they were asking god god bring forth your judgment judgment day is a day of celebration okay it right. is not to be taken as day where everything is going to be condemned judgment is justice is um, god going to set things right yes so the exactly. judgment day where god is going to set everything is right that is right. definitely a day of celebration that's a day of uh, uh, you know we call it sabbath we can take it that way yeah the real sabbath if you were real sabbath <laughs> we, completion we, we can see the completion, sabbath in its fullness oh yeah all right Absolutely I mean, fascinating. Yeah. Yes, Bertrand, go ahead, Bertrand. Sikander wants to say from a long time. No, Sikander, you have a question? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, you could. Uh, is it not? Uh, uh, could, could, yeah, could, could, yeah. Bertram, uh, Bertram, can you just hold on? Uh, let Sikander finish, and we'll come to you. Okay. It, it itself stands for Anno Domini in the year of the Lord. Yeah. That means each and every time is second is God's presence is there. Mm. that is the meaning i that, that's a full in a in a uh, chronological way we can see that day onwards the uh, sabbath sta sabbath started in its fullness for us oh but go ahead no uh, ms zakaria i just wanted uh, you to throw a little more uh, comments on what praveen mentioned and what david uh, uh, may probably not have understood fully Ravin was trying to help out. Could you, would you like to add anything to it? Uh, to, to David's question. Uh, David's question was about the second coming of Jesus, mm -hmm. and uh, after that the judgment day. Is that right, David? Is that your question? Yeah, yeah, that's what. Yeah. And uh, your question was, how is it connected, or? Uh, uh... Uh, because uh, my my question was, uh, the Sabbath day culminates. after the second coming of christ okay. because there will be new heavens and new earth i mean there's so many new jerusalem <laughs> new church so okay. so i mean that was my thought i mean i i may be wrong so please correct me <laughs> i think what we're doing is we are mixing up lots of things <laughs> 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 after judgment day new heavens new earth 
uh, we are mixing up a lot of things. I think uh, uh, we need to be, uh, you know, uh, be, uh, we have to be very careful that we don't bring in all this stuff all into one. Uh, right, right. There is nowhere in the scriptures that says that, you know, there will be an end of the Sabbath day. I mean, there is no, nowhere that is written. Okay. 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 Now the law states, you know, from evening to evening, you will keep your Sabbath, but that is part of the old covenant. All right. Uh, like Praveen said, I mean, uh, th there is a judgment day, if, if you'd like a judgment day, but a judgment is all, for me, judgment is a one, an ongoing kind of a thing, you know, an ongoing uh, phenomenon that takes place. But like Praveen said, there is a celebration <laughs> when our judgment is that we are found fully clothed in righteous clothes, you know, in Jesus Christ, our Lord. That is our only hope. There is no other hope that we have. Uh, I'm not sure, Bertram, if uh, uh, those were some of the thoughts uh, that needed to be mentioned. Any Anything so, else? You, you mean to clarify uh, or try to uh, uh, try to right the wrong where David mentioned at the second coming of Jesus Christ, there's new heavens and new earth. You may need to just uh, get that right. Uh, just uh, just mention that. It's uh, Second it's, coming of Jesus. Uh, the new heavens, new earth is the later date. Okay. <laughs> not not at Christ's second coming. Right. Let's let's leave it at this. There is yeah. going to be a second coming. There is also going to be a new heavens and new earth. Now, sure. how chronologically that fits in, let's not worry about that. Okay. <laughs> That's in the hands of God. And we okay. know that there is a second coming, there is a new heavens and a new earth. Okay. But if I can just mention, I think the time is already up. If I can just mention one more thought, uh, I, as I mentioned earlier. For me, Jesus Christ is my Sabbath. For me, Amen. Sabbath is not a day anymore. For me, Jesus Christ is, I mean, the Sabbath is a person and that is Jesus Christ. That's the reason why I can worship God anytime, any day, any moment. Right? I don't have to worship only on Sunday. I don't have to worship only on Saturday. I can worship, like for example, right now we are in worship. Right? So worship is any day, any time. So uh, because Christ is in me and I am in Christ, you know, at all times. Uh, I live in him, I move in him, I have my being in him. So he has become my Sabbath, if I can just leave that as a clarification. <laughs> okay, our time is up. Any last comments? Uh, we'll just uh, end with this. But it was really taxing, I guess. <laughs> Perhaps uh, maybe we just need to... Uh, so, because we have people and uh, we are around people who are been continuously tempted uh, to think the only Hebrew Bible is the right Bible or uh, uh, only King James Bible is the right. That's also 16th century uh, authorized KJV translation, Oxford version. He uh, alone is uh, uh, the right Bible. So regarding the translations, if you could make a uh, some little clarity on that how more translations are useful for us right that would be great what we'll do is uh, next time i think hopefully we'll finish this section next time and we will bring in the uh, tr uh, translation aspect also which bible to use some people are confused you know am i using the right bible or you know, things like that good thank you very much for joining us today it was a, a very good discussion and david would you like to lead us in a closing prayer Our Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for your beloved son. He has revealed us all the truth, and he's the Lord of Sabbath. We have discussed some very quintessential points uh, about you, Lord. We, we thank you, Father, Lord, that uh, you, are, you are so relational and so loving, Lord, unconditionally. Your love is so amazing. Father, Lord, help us to become closer to you and know more about you, Lord. Help us to reflect your love, Master Lord, because the, the, your love is the essence of the very existence what we are living today, Master. We thank you. We thank you for uh, revealing yourself to us. And there are many, many people out in our places, in our neighbors. Lord, they are searching for the truth but going to wrong places. Father Lord, I pray, Father Lord, that you will 
give us the unction and the and the help us that we'll be able to uh, be able to speak out your love to them uh, in a very friendly manner, in a loving manner, Lord. Grant us that uh, strength and also the wisdom, Father Lord. Thank you, Father Lord, that this wonderful uh, Bible study which you have uh, bestowed to us, help us, Lord, that we will be modified and confirmed to yourself, Master, and become more closer to you. Help us to grow in your love and uh, uh, become like you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, have a good evening, all of you, and continue to please be safe.